Welcome everyone. This is Jenkins, the Jenkins Online Meetup. And let's take a look and get started. We're delighted today to present a single open source security scanner for most languages on Jenkins with Luke O'Malley. Uh, we're pleased that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, would remind you that Jenkins Online Meetups are community-driven virtual meetups. They are intentionally focused on Jenkins, but anything about Jenkins, they can be case studies, they could be success stories, they could be things you learned or experienced that you would be willing to share with others. Uh, we are intentionally looking for speakers who are willing to be voice and present and share their experiences with Jenkins. Uh, please reach out to us through the Advocacy and Outreach Special Interest Group on Gitter at this URL if you would be interested in being a speaker at a Jenkins online meetup. We're very grateful to Luke today that he's willing to present to us, grateful for what we're going to learn from this and excited to be here. For questions and answers, we encourage you to ask your questions through the Zoom question and answer facility or through Zoom chat. We will collect those questions, invite you to uh, gather them together, and as we find them, we'll ask questions to Luke and let him answer. Then after the official recorded portion of this meeting, we will stop the recording and allow everyone to become voice so that we can ask each other questions off the record. We remind you that Jenkins has a code of conduct and we expect that everyone will comply with that code of conduct. We're kind to each other, we're good and decent, and we look forward to this presentation by Luke. So this is static analysis, and Luke's going to share with us his experiences working with SEMGREP. And Luke, let's go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Mark, and hello, everybody. Let me just go ahead and get screen sharing here. And can you confirm that you can see my screen, that that is correct? Can. I can see it just great. Thank you. Right. Fantastic. Uh, well, awesome. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to uh, throw them in the chat. Uh, it is much more fun to do a Zoom presentation uh, that is interactive uh, than one that uh, is not. Um, so just a quick background. My name is Luke. I'm the uh, head of product and one of the co-founders at R2C, uh, which is a software security company uh, based out of San Francisco. Uh, so obviously with COVID, uh, what does it mean to be based out of a particular city anymore? But for the most part, we're in San Francisco uh, and we've got about uh, 20 folks who are working on tools like SEMGREP. Um, so today, my plan was to talk about uh, a static analysis tool, uh, which is basically a tool that is used to scan source code and find bugs. Um, and it is a tool that is, uh, works across many languages and works across many environments. Um, so if you wanna run it in a Jenkins environment um, you know, during build time, fantastic. If you want to run this locally, it works locally on uh, Linux-based systems. So Mac, uh, Linux, Windows subsystem for Linux, things like that. Um, and I wanted to show you basically what is SEMGREP, uh, what it does well, and then how to actually set it up and run it in Jenkins. Um, so just at a, a high level, uh, and I'm curious in the, in the chat, who has interacted with or encountered a static analysis tool before? Is that a new term for folks? I see Mark, I can see Mark on the video raising his hands. Um, so just a, a quick background, uh, static analysis is a field that has been around for a long time. Uh, very simply, uh, the static part means that you take source code, you just take source code files, and uh, you basically look at them and you try to determine what they do without running. So just like reading, reading source code. So source code comes in and kind of conclusions about that code comes out, but you haven't run it. Um, on, on any kind of system, you haven't necessarily compiled it. So that's at a high level what static analysis is. And um, what we're doing with SEMGREP is providing a tool that is uh, open source and works on many languages. So we're up to about 17 languages now, and there's more coming every day. I'll talk about what those specific languages are. Um, and kind of in the spirit of open source, um, you know, I think we found that there have been other efforts before us uh, that have kind of either proprietary rules or um, maybe like closed ecosystems. 
And so for SEMGREP, there actually is a community registry. Um, anyone can contribute to the registry. So you can publish your rules uh, or kind of like your packages to it. Um, and there's so far a uh, thousand plus rules across um, all the languages that we support. And um, I think what, what folks will see if you take a look, they generally get broken up by language. So there's like Python rules, you know, Golang rules. And there's also rules by, uh, for specific frameworks. So let's say you're doing um, in Python, uh, Django web app development. Um, you can find rules for something like that. And then sometimes there's just things that are more like topical. So cross-site scripting is something that security uh, professionals tend to care about. Uh, so you can find rules to that. Um, so really, really active community, uh, particularly on Slack actually. Um, so if folks are interested in getting involved, there's a, uh, an active community on Slack. Um, for this tool, uh, you know, it's really fantastic that there are so many rules that are available already, um, but everyone's environment and code base and company is a little bit different. And so uh, we have focused uh, as, a, on a, as a project on making it really easy to write rules. And so you write rules that look like the code you're trying to match. And so I'll show you what that looks like, but you don't have to learn any kind of complicated um, you know, domain specific language. And I'd mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, it's important that it run everywhere. And so uh, for our project, uh, you can run it in your terminal, you can run it in the editor, uh, you can run it in Jenkins. Um, so it's a highly portable tool. And uh, the last piece that I wanna mention, and this will be relevant, I think for all those who are adding SEMgrep uh, to maybe a Jenkins uh, build system, is that you can set it up so that it only flags new issues moving forward. Um, and I think kind of our, our observation, our experience as we set up tooling on our projects is that um, you have really good intentions. You wanna set up some kind of code scanning so really, really good intentions. And then you're punished by the tool because you have existing violations. And so you can't get your green check mark on your build. Uh, and uh, we all know that we love our green check marks uh, up and down. So um, there is a possibility to make it kind of looking forward uh, so you can start to improve the quality of your project. Um, and I, I mentioned this already, I just want to give you a, a sense of kind of where people use the tool. So uh, it is uh, something that you can use locally. Uh, and you can brew install it, pip install it. Um, if you use Docker, there's a Docker image that's published. Um, so there's a couple different ways to consume it or get it running. And then once you have it installed, um, there's a, a pretty, say, healthy set of flags that you can pass this command line tool. Um, but the main one that folks use is this dash config flag. Uh, and that lets you actually specify things from the registry. So if you, there's a rule that you see on the registry you like or a collection of rules, um, you can just do dash dash config. It for you downloads the rules from the registry uh, and then runs them on your, your source code. Um, so, so pretty straightforward to use, uh, use there. Um, and I promised you that it was uh, an open source project. So I just wanted to show you a couple stats. Um, it's LGPL uh, two licensed. Uh, for those of you at companies that um, maybe licensing has to be very particular for the tools that you use. Um, we have a growing number of contributors. Um, so if you write Python or you want to learn OCaml, uh, there are some really good opportunities there. Um, and we release uh, very frequently. So um, since the project's inception, we've had 95 releases. We release every one to two weeks, um, you know, bug fixes, improvements, new languages and things like that. So there's a really fast cadence uh, and the project is getting better, uh, better every day. Um, and then just to kind of round out, hey, so there's this tool, it scans code, uh, it very likely runs uh, on your system or the place that you need it to run, because uh, it's portable. Um, kind of does it actually work for the languages that my organization is developing in? Um, so I'm mostly showing here languages that we call generally available. And so these are ones that uh, the community spent a lot of time to harden. And we, we mostly look at parse rate. So how much uh, code are we able to successfully parse uh, in this target language? And so for these languages, we're at, I think it's 99.9% .9 parse rate across really large corpuses of open source uh, projects. Um, and there's a bunch of stats and dashboards I can show you, but we've taken this really data-driven approach to like, what does it mean to have something that's generally available? Um, so on that list, uh, I'd mentioned kind of, we'll say modern languages. So we've got Go, uh, we've had a lot of work recently in Ruby and TypeScript. Um, for those of you who are working with uh, configuration file formats, 
Um, a little bit more experimental, but we have this thing called generic, which has been letting us do YAML files. Um, you know, if you have JSON config, we actually do support JSON natively. Um, so kind of what this leads to is, hey, there's one tool. It probably works for the majority of the things that, you know, your organization may encounter. At least that's what I've been finding so far for the, the people that I've been helping. Um, and you can write rules for these languages too. So if you have an idea, I'm going to show you how to do that in just a little bit. So I just want to uh, take a quick pause because I just went over a whole bunch of what is this tool. Um, are there any questions so far? So I, I actually had a question with regard to, you said rules that look like my code. Yes. Uh, so if I'm a C yeah. programmer, I can express rules in, in C, or if I'm a Python program, I can, programmer, I can express rules in Python? Yep, exactly. And I'm gonna, I'm actually, I'll, I will pull that up because we'll do uh, what's effectively like a kind of copy paste is the way that I, all of my rules when I'm starting them, I say, oh, this is the, the target code, the stuff that I wanna match. And I'll actually copy and paste that. Uh, and that's, that's the basis for my rule for my pattern. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and I assume that, that you'll at some point maybe describe the difference between generic and your generic model and some more specific things that ag aggressively target YAML syntax checking. But for yeah. me, this one, the in my language is, is quite interesting and quite important, so. Yeah, so I, and I, I'll, uh, I will definitely touch on that. And I see that there's a, a question in the chat too about uh, some other tools, for instance, the Sonar Cube system. Um, I think I will touch on that a little bit later. Uh, so Manuel, if you're if you're okay, I will delay that question. Um, but keep me honest and feel free to bring that up in like five minutes. Awesome. Um, so real quick, where I switched over to, I just went to the SEMGREP website. Uh, it got a facelift yesterday. So if you've been on this previously, we had a, a different logo for the project, a different website. Uh, and late last night, it got updated. Um, so I'm just on the website and a lot of the presentation that I'm giving, I've actually pulled from the, the website. So um, you'll see some, some similar content. What I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, and this is kind of in the vein of making it easier to write rules, is that we have a play, uh, thing that we call the playground. And so I'm just gonna click over to that. And um, the playground is effectively a uh, online, uh, kind of, we call it an editor, a rule editor. So as you're experimenting with rules, you can do that here. Um, so you don't have to run things locally. And maybe most powerfully, um, the thing that I use it the most for is that I can share rules. So if I write something, I can get a, a URL to send to somebody else to say, hey, I have this cool new thing. What do you think? And what's very cool is that SEMGREP, the command line tool, actually understands these URLs. So if you write a rule in the editor, and that's where you're doing your development with, um, there's some nice debugging niceties and things, you can then run it locally to actually see, hey, would this have caught the bug that I'm trying to catch? Um, so there's some really, really cool stuff there. So what I wanted to show you is I've got a little bit of Python code, uh, and I promised you that uh, rules look like the code you're trying to match. So uh, really, that's, I wanna say like trivial use case here is that a print statement makes it into a production environment. Uh, and this is actually a rule that we run. Uh, we don't want print statements. We want to use our logging framework. Um, so how do we prevent print statements from making it in? Um, so I want to show you what it looks like to just try to match this. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start by copying and then pasting the segment of code that I want to match. Um, and if I run this as is, I'll get a basically a, uh, identical match, right? So what I copied matches this line. But um, that is probably, it's only useful if someone exactly types out my uh, debugging uh, Skynet uh, init vector uh, a statement. Um, what if I don't care about uh, what's within the print statement? And this is where I'm gonna start to draw a bunch of analogies to, uh, to grep. I have the ability to basically like enter in a wild card and say, hey, I don't care about the stuff that's in, in between my two parentheses. Um, and so I'm just gonna do this dot, dot, dot uh, which is equivalent to like a dot star in regex, um, kind of wildcard. And that will then match any print statement that has uh, one or more arguments um, uh, in it. Or actually, it's zero or more arguments. Um, so it kind of generalizes the rule. So this is what most rule set, uh, snippets or kind of little, um, I guess, snippets uh, will look like. Um, any 
kind of questions there. I just wanted to quickly show you and I'll talk about how this works and why it's not actually text matching and um, all the kind of uh, cool tech behind it. Um, but hopefully you have a, a sense of what, what a rule would look like uh, and what it's doing. So uh, Luke, you said it's not actually doing regex. So it's not as simple as a, as a pattern match. There's much more going on here. Um, there is a lot, yeah, there's a lot more going on here. And okay. that is actually a great segue into how it works. Um, so uh, I don't know, actually I'd be curious for the group who has used regex to write a, basically like a code rule or try to find uh, coding issues. Um, it's something that, that we had done a lot on the, on the team. And uh, it turns out that actually grep is maybe one of the greatest static analysis tools <laughs> out there. Uh, but it, it has some problems. Um, and the problem is that uh, strings and string searching uh, is not equivalent to what uh, source code actually looks like or how the computer understands source code, which is as a tree. And so the way that I think about some grep is that it's basically grep, but for trees. So that little snippet that I showed you, um, you know, we're not doing a, a string search on it. That little snippet is gonna get turned into basically a tree masher. And it's going to go look through your source code and navigate that tree and find you know nodes uh, and expressions that match and some grep uh, i guess as a term is meant to mean semantic grep and so it's a tool that is aware of the semantics of the language uh, and the code uh, that you're analyzing so i i can just give you a quick example of that um, where maybe grep would have have some trouble so uh, this is a JavaScript example now. And pretty classically, like you don't want to use exec. Um, you don't want to execute uh, you know, arbitrary uh, input. And so we just want to find all of the uh, occurrences of that. We want to ban it from our, uh, our code base. So if I were to use grep, um, you'd actually, I think, be able to get pretty far here. You, know, you could write a pattern that matches the word exec and maybe includes a, a left parenthesis. And that's probably a pretty good indicator that there's at least a function that uh, ends in the word exec, uh, you know, you start, you're starting a function call. But where you'll run into, uh, I think, pain with grep is when it comes to white space. So what if someone, you know, includes a space before the parentheses? It turns out that that is valid, uh, valid JavaScript. Um, what if there are new line characters? Um, that's going to start to be very painful in grep. So your, your expression is going to get more and more complicated. Uh, what if it's not actually code? It's a comment. Um, so we don't want to flag comments because that's that's not code. Um, and you might actually get people just printing out or logging strings, right? And so there's all these cases that suddenly you have to think about, um, which again, if you're writing a rule for a single file, or like you're trying to grep a single file, uh, probably good enough. But once you start trying to use that rule on many projects or thousands of projects, kind of scale it up, um, you start to get into system pain. So I'm just going to type uh, exec here. Um, and very similar to what I typed before, I don't, just for sake of demo, I don't really care um, if there's any arguments or um, what comes between the brackets. Um, and so I'll just run this. And what we'll see is that we actually correctly deal with uh, spaces, you know, new lines, we don't see the comment, uh, and we actually know that this is a string literal. And so it's not, basically it's not code that's going to be executed. Um, so we ignore it. Um, there's a, a caveat here where uh, for, I think a lot of tools, um, particularly in the open source domain. So you think of like ESLint, Bandit uh, and some others. Um, sometimes they're used for style enforcement. And so for some grep, we've explicitly made this decision that we do not do style. Um, and it's not even possible to do style because we remove uh, white space, we remove comments and we are looking at just that uh, true representation of the code. So we don't actually have that data, uh, styling data uh, to look at. Um, so that is uh, just kind of a comparison to grep. And let me just skip ahead quickly. Um, this is a, a, a diagram that came out of uh, Instagram. So Instagram does a lot of uh, static analysis and I'm, I stole part of their diagram. Um, so they were trying to do a comparison of where tools fall on the spectrum of you know, easy but dumb code scanning all the way to powerful but complex code scanning. Um, and on the, the easy side, this is really where, uh, where grep is. Uh, and on the more powerful but complex side, you get a lot of the proprietary um, uh, kind of maybe more 
expensive uh, options. And so for us with SEMGREF, we really wanted to sit somewhere in the middle. So it was said, hey, we think the opportunity um, kind of with, with the community is that we need an easy tool, but it's smart. It's a powerful tool, but it's simple. Uh, and so we're trying to, to kind of make the right set of, uh, right set of trade-offs. And so uh, Mark, this is basically the statement you had made earlier. Uh, you know, hey, you're telling me that if I, if I can write C, I can write a rule in C. Um, it's basically the case for, for any of the languages uh, that we support. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, just looking through the chat, any questions so far? My, my thought, just to kind of uh, maybe broadcast where I'm going, I want to talk a little bit about use cases that I've seen for the tool. So kind of talk about capabilities, mm -hmm. talk about some use cases, um, and actually wanted to show you how, uh, how my team is using SEMGREP uh, in a CI type of setting and the types of things that we check for. Uh, and then I was going to go on to talk about Jenkins specific configs. So kind of from the group, are there any questions that I can answer? Well, there was a there was a question that was asked that I attempted to answer on my own related to coverage, asking, hey, does this report coverage? And my assumption was it doesn't report coverage because it's not actually executing the code. Therefore, it really couldn't report coverage. Is there a coverage kind of concept in mm -hmm. SEMGREP that, that is worth discussing? I'm not sure I would know what that might be. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great question. So we don't do coverage reports right now. Um, you know, I haven't, uh, Kendall, I haven't thought too much about what would technically be involved there. Um, I think one of the interesting parts is that because it's an extensible tool, I suspect that you could kind of mix and match uh, some grep per perhaps with um, just like other approaches or other coverage tools. Uh, you can, so I, I didn't mention this early on, but you can use SEMGREP as a Python library as well. And so if you want to basically like natively call SEMGREP from your own code, uh, you, can, you can do that. You don't have to you know, shell out or um, try to build a pipeline with uh, uh, the SEMGREP CLI. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, and then I see that there's a question just on how to get started. Uh, on the, the website that I was on, that SEMGREP.dev website, um, if I just click back, um, there is uh, documentation. Um, so that's a great place. And there's actually a big old get started button uh, that just takes you to, uh, if I click through that, uh, it just takes you to the docs and very similar to what I was showing before you, know, you get started, but basically installing the thing locally. Um, and then there's some sample configs and um, sample patterns that you can run. Um, and then on the secrets and API key matching, um, I will talk a little bit about the registry uh, in just a little like towards the end of the presentation. Um, so there are some rules that I have seen for secret matching. Um, the caveat is that uh, they can be noisy, which I think quite a few secret tools can be. Um, and so there's a question on who should run it. If you should run it at CI time and you know break the build, uh, bring it to developers' attention, or if those types of rules might be better for uh, kind of like audit type scans that would go to a, a dedicated team like the security team. Um, and then, uh, Manuel, I see you have a question about uh, private uh, private rules. Um, so I'll I'll show uh, when I get to the Jenkins piece. We have a basically like a, a wrapper around SEMGREP um, that's called SEMGREP Agent, and uh, it understands how to pull in like local config files. And actually, when you run SEMGREP locally for the command line tool, you can pass it in. Um, rule files as well. So that's an option for private organizations. And then um, something I won't talk about, but there is a basically paid infrastructure on top of this and people host private rules uh, through that paid infrastructure as well. Um, and I see a question about, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna push on, I see a couple more questions. Um, I'm gonna push on because I think I will answer them over the course of the, the presentation. Sweet. Um, so just some use cases, because when I when I first started using SEMGREP, I didn't quite realize all the things you could do with it. Um, so go through some of the uh, the greatest hits. Uh, a lot of folks, when they're looking for you know, static analysis tools, it's usually some kind of compliance, like there's a contractual obligation, and we've got to run it. Uh, and so there's a bunch of rules for uh, OWASP top 10. Um, writing your own rules. 
so I didn't really touch on this, but um, you know, if you write write rules, you know, grep is really easy. Let's say you want to extend really any other tool uh, that's out there, um, you know, like ESLint, uh, Bandit, um, or even some of the commercial ones. Um, it turns out it's just like really hard to to write rules because you you don't get to express the rule um, basically as code. Uh, so you have to think of like, okay, I, I see source code. What does that look like as a tree? And then you write this kind of complicated, what's called like a node visitor, right? And so you start to refer to specific nodes and suddenly you have to have expertise on program analysis and uh, uh, programming languages. Um, and so I think for us, really the, the use case for most folks is that they have a, a rule that they wanna write themselves. Uh, and it's just the simplest way of doing it. Um, we've seen a lot of people use this to enforce uh, code guardrails. Um, so the idea here is that um, you basically ensure that people are using the correct libraries and frameworks. Uh, and if you use these libraries and frameworks, you're kind of uh, default safe. Um, and so a really, really nice example of this, uh, we've probably assume have all run into or heard of SQL injection at some point uh, in our careers. Um, Right, so how do we get rid of SQL injection? Well, we could try to detect uh, you know, that there is a, a user input flowing into a SQL query, or you could say, hey, I'm just gonna use an object relational mapper. I'm gonna use one of these uh, many libraries that wrap SQL. And in doing so, you eliminate almost entirely the possibility of SQL injection because you are actually separating out uh, basically data from control. Uh, and so that's like the main selling point of using object relational mapper. If you've uh, in the Python world used SQL alchemy, that's a great example. Uh, and so my understanding is this is actually the approach that Google took uh, uh, many years back uh, and they've never looked back since. Um, so it's just, you choose the right frameworks, you choose the right libraries, your code base will be safer. And so let's enforce that people are actually uh, using them. Um, if you are uh, on the bug bounty crowd, you could hunt vulnerabilities uh, and you can also just standardize library and API usage. So Deprecated APIs is a pretty common one. Um, you, know, you just want to make sure that people are using the new stuff, not the old stuff. Uh, and so you can do that. Um, and I wanted to show you how, how we're using it. It's not a security example, but um, I mean, really for us, I think most of the value that we get out of SEMGREP and we run it, you know, uh, it runs on every single commit uh, at, at R2C. Um, it's really around enforcement of our own uh, like standards. So if we have a, a, a user facing bug, security, performance, like whatever it might be, um, oftentimes as a consequence of that bug report, we'll write a SEMGREP rule to try to catch that, catch or prevent that issue from happening again in the future. And so we're just kind of constantly codifying uh, you know, institutional knowledge. And so as new people come onto the team, you don't have to think as hard about if you're doing something correctly uh, because other people before you who have seen the consequences of a decision um, have written a SEMGREP rule for it. So let me just show you what that looks like. As a quick pause, folks still with me, still following? Am I going too fast or is this an okay speed? Your pace is great for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if I'm feeling like it, I've got, I think there are several more questions that will arrive. You keep going and we'll we'll keep collecting questions. Thank you. Yeah, great. And this bit is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, so I, I've got the, the playground open again, uh, and it's a little bit more advanced this time. So I've got actual test code down below. And what I haven't mentioned yet, you know, I showed you these really, really simple snippets um, uh, earlier in the presentation. And I did not mention that you can actually combine them with a, basically a Boolean logic. And this is what gives rules, I wanna say like uh, uh, most of their power. So there's a lot of fancy program analysis happening, but the fact that you can compose patterns and say the pattern must be this, you know, but not that uh, gives you this ability to create very uh, specific and targeted rules. So we ran into this issue where um, I guess some browsers as a security issue, uh, security um, feature uh, don't allow you to access a local storage. And um, we wanted to ensure that anytime we try to access local storage uh, for our, our front end code, uh, it is wrapped with a try catch so that we can gracefully um, gracefully fail. And this was uh, basically causing issues for us because you know uh, a, a few weeks would go by, 
someone would forget about this. You try to access local storage. It would work for you, um, you know, for other folks or for kind of end users, it wouldn't. Uh, and so we wanted to, uh, to catch this. So we look for all the places where uh, there is access to local storage. Um, again, we don't care about what the, um, the arguments are. And we actually don't care about what uh, method we use. And so there's a, an additional concept that um, on the website, if you go through it, or you go through our, our tutorial, um, you'll learn about this meta variable, uh, basically named capture group um, uh, convention that we have. But we're saying, hey, find me all the places where we use local storage. I don't care what the, uh, what the function call is, and I don't care what its arguments are. But let's make sure that it doesn't appear inside of code that has a try catch um, where we recover browser security error. Um, and there's a couple different variants of that. Uh, and so we use this uh, and it has actually proven uh, quite effective. So there's a couple, um, quite a few test examples here as we, we dialed in the rule. Um, but I think this would be a great, great use for SEMGREP where it's, it's highly relevant for you. It's highly relevant for the members of your engineering team. Um, and again, it's something that, you know, probably doesn't generalize because these are things that are specific to R2C, right? These are these like helper methods that we've written. Um, so you would have to write the rule and it's, it's easy to do so uh, with, with some grub. Um, and then I'd also mentioned that there was this community registry. So I'm gonna quickly click through that. Um, we've been really fortunate that uh, members of the community who have you know, basically specialized knowledge either in security or Go performance um, or uh, the OWASP ASVS framework um, have been willing to step up and uh, make contributions uh, to the to the registry. And so um, clicking through, I'm on SEMGRIP again, and I'm just under rules here. So this is the rules registry. You can go through and you can look at kind of different um, rule sets, excuse me, different rule sets that people have published. And I'll just click into one for, for Go. And anytime you're, you're looking for these rule sets, uh, you'll always see that they have this um, semgrep dash dash config line that I can copy. So if you want to run it locally, uh, you just copy it that way. Um, and you can look through and find uh, the types of things uh, that this will check for. Um, and then you can also browse all of the rules uh, as well. So if you want to kind of filter, uh, you know, look for things that are related to Python, maybe things that are related to Python best practices, you'd be able to do that under the rules tab here. So a lot of, a lot of rules uh, and definitely more, more every day. Um, so I was thinking I, I would start to transition into what does this look like uh, to integrate into CI? Um, so before I make that transition, are there any questions that I can answer about the registry uh, or rule writing or some group? So I did not see any new arrivals, and certainly there is already a question about how do you integrate with with branch based builds and into your CI server. So there are already questions asking about the next step. Great. So it sounds like I should talk about the next step then. So let's let's dive in. Um, I am on the SEMGREP uh, docs uh, tab, um, so I've got that open. Uh, there's a bunch of different inf uh, there's a bunch of information about uh, different CI providers. And I'm just going to pop down to this standalone providers because uh, that would give me a chance to talk about how SEMGREP works. So in CI, um, there are folks who are running SEMGREP, just kind of the vanilla SEMGREP command line tool that I showed you before. Um, I would say most people, though, are using this kind of CI wrapper called SEMGREP agent. Um, and so this is a separate repository uh, on GitHub. So just showing it here. And um, SEMGREP action is special because it understands uh, or has like greater knowledge of Git. So it's actually able to um, you know, do things like uh, Git log, it can check out previous commits. Um, it understands uh, .git ignores, it understands, uh, it has its own ignore file, a .semgrep ignore. So if you want to exclude vendor code as an example, um, all of that functionality is going to come out of this thing called SEMGREP action. And uh, again, it's, it's published a couple different ways. So you can either uh, install it as a Python um, library, so you can pip install it. Um, and I would say most people use it as a Docker image, um, which is what we're going to use in, in just a little bit here for, for Jenkins. 
And um, what's cool about this, <clears throat> so I'm not showing it here, but there's a, a couple uh, command line arguments that you can pass um, specifically to deal with branches where uh, I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, you, know, you shouldn't be punished for trying to add a tool uh, for security, right? So you shouldn't have to like fix however many issues you had in the past. Let's just get this tool installed and kind of looking forward. So if you're running SEMgrep and SEMgrep agent on a pull request, you can configure it so that it will basically do two scans. It scans the latest uh, commit on that pull request. So the latest version of the code, and then it will go back and scan the uh, base commit of the pull request. And so you're looking at, okay, what is the code that's changed from when the person you know, branched and started their feature development to conclusion of their feature development? So when we run those two scans, it lets us look at the results and say, okay, well, now we know which results are new, uh, you know, as of this base commit and whatever is on, on head. So you can then show your, uh, basically the user, the developer in this case, issues that they are responsible for introducing, not all the stuff that came before. Um, it's also faster. So uh, if you use SEMgrip agent, it won't scan on you know, on pull requests. So set it up in this, this diff aware way. Um, it won't scan the entire code base. It will only scan the files that have changed. Uh, so you get some interesting performance improvements there. Um, and because you're showing people results that they have introduced, the likelihood that they fix those, those issues goes way up um, instead of just showing them, hey, there were pre-existing issues, please fix them. Well, it's not in code that I touched. I, I don't wanna think about it. Um, this is actually code that they've touched. Uh, and so very likely that they fix it. Um, and so we, we mentioned a couple of these things here. I, I talked about this baseline ref. Um, it's kind of a key feature uh, for doing the diff aware scanning and is what most people are, are doing. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we have an action and it gets published as a Docker image. Let me show you then what Jenkins config looks like. Um, so this is a, a friend of mine set up a, a Jenkins file and he has a, a sample project uh, that is a known vulnerable project called Let's Be Bad Guys. Um, so <clears throat> things to note, uh, we're running uh, within Docker. We're using the SEMgrip agent image um, so most folks will use this V1 tag, which is basically our stable tag or latest tag. Um, so it's making sure that you get the, uh, you know, the latest and greatest uh, updates to SEMgrep, um, but it's also uh, well-tested uh, and not, not unstable. Um, and then when it actually comes to uh, running, <clears throat> running this, the call that, uh, that he's making is Python. Uh, he's calling SEMgrep agent. Uh, and He's using it in a way that is actually authenticated with the registry. Um, and this is uh, so that you could do private rules or kind of custom rule sets. So that is one way that you can run it. And I believe if I switch over actually to a different branch. <clears throat> yeah, so an, an alternative way that he has it configured here is just to hard code uh, which rule set to use. So you could do that as well. So there's no dependency on logging in. Um, there's some benefits if you do. Uh, and then in this case, uh, you can also just hard code which rules you want to run in CI. Um, through this approach, you would also be able to do files that are uh, local. So someone had asked about private rules earlier. Um, in this case, I'd basically check in those rules to the repository. And then when I actually do my SEMgrep agent invocation, uh, I would pass in the path of those, uh, those local private rules. Um, so that, that should work for you. Um, and there's some other, other niceties here. So uh, just to kind of point out all of this stuff that's up above, all this environment information. Um, this is because, uh, so for, for Dahan, uh, who's the name of the person who set this up, um, this work is that he gets Slack notifications, inline PR comments, and kind of like a suite of other things that are not possible just with SEMgrip agent, um, but he actually has a dependency on uh, our external system and these environment variables become important for that. So just wanted to show you that. Um, and then in terms of it being in action, if I just pop out, <clears throat> um, so I've got my Jenkins pipeline and uh, there's a lot of red uh, because <laughs> we're doing testing and trying to trigger failures, I promise. Uh, but let me show you what it looks like when it actually runs. So the most basic output that you would get when you use the SEMgrip agent 
is something that looks uh, basically looks like this. Uh, it's just a little bit dense. But if there are issues, you'll get printouts um, just directly in your, your build output. Um, and so here we can see that in this file, vulnerable views, uh, we found a string comparison using uh, is. Uh, and there's some issues in Python if you're doing string comparison with is. So we flagged that issue. Uh, and then we also flagged an issue with uh, misuse of globals here. And so we'll print out a little bit of what the code is kind of give the, um, the developer context uh, and then print out uh, what's designed to be a, a helpful actionable error message. Um, so you know kind of what your next step should be. Uh, and these are rules that are just coming from the, the registry. Now, now Luke, those are incremental changes. So you did not show me the, <clears throat> the everybody else's dirty laundry. You're that, only that, showing me. <laughs> that, that is a, a great question. So if I go back to the config, um, and this is something I'll have to confirm with, with Dahan. I actually don't see him using the, the baseline ref flag. So my thought is on, on the basis of that, these are actually the issues that are in the project. Okay, and so this I, is project wide, unless I use the baseline reference thing. Yeah, exactly. And if I um, just take a look here, I'm just seeing what some of the other folks have done. Yeah, so I'm looking at different provider um, so forgive me, not, not Jenkins, but in Circle CI, uh, I see here that we actually are passing in, or, or the person who contributed this config is passing in baseline ref. And my understanding is that is necessary uh, to do the differential, um, differential work. And there's been, I got to say, so I, I love the Unix philosophy where you have a tool, one tool, it does one thing well, uh, and then people can kind of mix and match and, you know, pipeline that, that tool. So Someone the other day uh, wanted to scan on every merge to main or develop, right? So they want to run SEMGREP, do a whole scan, but uh, they didn't want to scan all of the code, right? They just want to scan kind of what's recently changed. And so I think what they did is they used this baseline ref argument and they did like, you know, head tilde tilde two, something like that. So it's in Git, they were trying to go back two commits or three commits. Um, and so they were able to actually not do PR scanning, but they were doing scanning on main and develop, and they were looking at relatively small change sets. Um, and so there were some, there's some cool uh, benefits to that, both on speed and then really old issues they weren't flagging. They were still flagging, you know, issues that had happened within the last couple of days. Um, so that was kind of their, their hack and their workflow. So yeah, so I think you'd want the baseline ref, um, which I think is not, uh, not in this example right now. Um, yeah, so it's pretty pretty basic output. Um, I think what we'll end up doing, we'll put a little bit more time into this. The feedback that I've gotten as we've been trying to figure out, okay, what what tickets do we want to act on and, and prioritize as a maintainer group? Um, it just turns out that I think most developers don't particularly want to go to build out, output to find the issue uh, that they have to fix. Uh, and so the kind of number one, there's two two leading requests. One is just give me a comment on my pull request. And so that's a feature that we support, um, but you, ha you have to unfortunately go through uh, the logged in version of semgrep.dev, it's free, but you do have to go through it. Um, and then the other feature is I wanna just run this stuff in my editor. And so when I look towards, okay, hey, it's a project, um, what are we doing next? Is we're focusing on uh, adding support for JetBrains. Um, so if people are running this in CI, let's let them run it in JetBrains as they write, write their code. And we already do have a VS Code integration, um, but we want to expand support for that. And so the, the big ask that we've had is we want to, um, people want to be able to ensure that what they run at CI time is what runs locally. And so there are some improvements that we want to make so that you basically can guarantee that the rules that are running in CI are the rules that are going to run locally. Um, and then we're also working on performance and parsing uh, optimizations. Um, so we're very much performance obsessed. Uh, the tool is already very fast. Um, it's very, very, very unlikely that it's the slowest part of your test and build system. So I think it takes about a minute on average, um, but we want it to be better. And then we're adding uh, additional languages. So uh, there's been a, a bunch of interest from the community in mobile languages. So Kotlin and Swift. Um, turns out Scala doesn't have a lot of really great program analysis tools. So we've talked about Scala uh, and then C Sharp uh, has been top of mind recently. Um, let's see. What else can I what else can I show you all? I think that is basically coming to the end of the prepared content, um, but would love to uh, answer any questions and 
and click around uh, if anyone wants to see more. So, so there was a question you alluded to its answer earlier. I wanted to see if you wanted to go further on that. Can you can the rules register be hosted internally? You mentioned storing it inside the repository. Are people also able to get some equivalent to the semgrep.dev site feeling, but on an internal site, or is that not allowed? Could you share more about that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so the registry right now, there's not a internal variant uh, of the registry. Um, so the registry code itself is not basically not open source. We've talked about making it um, source code available. Uh, we there's still some discussion about if it if the infrastructure code should be open source and openly licensed. Um, so feedback, welcome on that. Um, what we have seen people do is that you ca you can download rules from the uh, the registry, uh, and actually there are you basically can curl. And I'm happy to talk through the endpoints, but you can curl configuration um, endpoints, and so you can just download the raw uh, like rule config. Um, so if you wanted to set up some kind of cron job or something like that, just to make sure you have the latest and greatest, um, you definitely definitely within your uh, ability, and uh, we we support that. Um, now on the kind of like playground side. Um, so currently there's not an internally hosted version of that. Um, we have basically like once you kick over to, to no longer open source, but like paid stuff, there's an enterprise tier. Uh, and that's like something we could discuss for that. Um, but there's not something right now you can just go get clone uh, and then stand up internally. Super, thank you. Another question, this one a little more precise. What's the minimum Python version required to run SEMGREP? That is a great question. So I'm going to refresh myself, uh, and I'm hoping that it is in our documentation. Um, I think it is. It's definitely Python three, uh, and I'm looking for the minimum version. So I will uh, update our docs so that we definitely have the minimum version. And quite surprised. So Python three, and I'm thinking it's three six, um, but I forget offhand. I will add that to the docs. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. but so so grateful to hear it's not Python two where support <laughs> ended in January of 2020. That's good. You're you're not carrying along ancient ancient history. So very good. Yeah. And uh, worst case, I know that uh, Python can be a pain in the butt for everybody, uh, which is why we also have uh, have Docker. Um, right. Just that that seems to be the uh, you know the big hammer to bring out uh, if your Python environment's not working. So now, are there things that you've learned on this static analysis journey where you'd share with, with others, hey, here are things that static analysis is really good at and other things that it's not as good at? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing, uh, earlier I talked about this idea of like code guardrails. Um, so I think, so static analysis generally gets this bad rap that it's, it's super noisy and it tells me things that maybe I should fix, maybe I shouldn't. Um, it's like SQL injection. I brought that up earlier, right? It's like, well, does the, the piece of software really understand, um, you know, how you do user input sanitization and all that? It's like, eh, it probably doesn't. Um, and so if you, you make this switch to code guardrails and you say, hey, we just, we don't use raw SQL here. We use an object relational mapper. Um, that switch, it's no longer a like, well, this might be a problem. It's pretty black and white. It's like, we do, we do this and we don't do that. Um, and the, the response I think is that, oh, this tool is actually valuable. It is, it's helped me um, because it's just, it's less like I can't go and argue with it as much. It's like, oh no, I'm just, I'm, I need to follow our conventions as a company or as a, as a team, we've agreed to this. So kind of, I think my, my big learning is actually maybe more like the, um, like the psychology of static analysis which is that it's far more effective for you to uh, enforce the use of specific frameworks and APIs um, and maybe like look for business logic issues, whatever it may be that are specific to your organization than to have a, hmm, well, this might be a security issue type of check. Um, and so a lot of the rules that, that we've written and added to the registry are of that vein. And I think the ones that we get the most value out of internally um, as a company at R2C are the ones that are like, we just don't do it this way Here's, here's what you should be doing. Um, so the, the perception is much more positive. Now, 
are there are there things that you've found where hey semantic analysis or, or static analysis really wasn't doing what i needed i had to do some other technique or are there is it mm. you found it you found in your space it just works well yeah that is that is a really good question um you know i think that uh it's not the full answer. So like if you're using static analysis, that does not mean that your code base is secure, right? So um, I think that's that's my concern is particularly on the, I'm adding you know static analysis for compliance and to kind of get my checkbox. I think where things start to go potentially off the rails. So just because you have static analysis doesn't mean you just get to like live live free and party in your code base all day, every day. Um, you still have to be thoughtful about uh, what's the architecture of our system. Uh, you know, what are the ramifications of how we're deploying it? Uh, you get into a whole host of issues, right? More around kind of uh, your deployment environment and uh, network configuration, and everything else. Um, so I love static analysis because it lets you ensure that your foundation is solid, right? It, it does help you kind of at the source address security issues. Um, but there are still many other layers on top of that. And so you probably have to complement with other tools. Um, and then I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, find the right tool for, for the job. And so sometimes rules are complicated enough that SEMGREP is not the right tool to try to use. Um, you know, maybe you should go with one of those tools that is uh, more complicated. Um, so in the SQL injection case, right? If you absolutely have to scan for SQL injection and you can't do paved road, you might need a tool that does this whole program analysis um, and that you really need to spend a lot more time to figure out how to use and uh, write rules for. Um, some grep's getting more powerful. So I think that we, we will get there. Um, but as of today, if you have to have that, then I would say like, this isn't the right tool. Cause we are, what I, what I failed to mention is some grep is fast in part because it scans single files. So it's not trying to compile your entire program. It's looking at you know, individual files um and that is particularly good for this kind of code guardrails you know paved road approach um but it it is less good at things like sql injection um where it's cross file as a benefit though if there's any uh, java users out there uh you don't have to build your java code in order to use some grep it runs on just the raw source so you're you do not have to have a compilable project to run some grep which is uh so, pretty pretty cool. so now that there's a there's a, a different kind of question. So we've got a new question that just arrived. Do you have support or examples using cloud native build packs? And and I'll I'll leave it to you to infer the meaning of that. Is there is there anything special around cloud native here? Not that I uh, not that I know of. Um, that might be. Uh, I see that Jeff asked that. Might be a, a good question on the community Slack. And I think what I found is that a lot of people have used some grep in a lot of different places. Um, and so that might be a good, uh, uh, basically community uh, question. Yeah, so I was envisioning that, okay, this is because you've got a Docker image available, but that Docker image could be executed in a Kubernetes cluster or cloud oh, yeah. native just as readily as it's executed anywhere else in Docker. But I'm not sure that that's, that's really addressing the specific question that he had. So. Yeah. So Jeff, Jeff, if there's any any refinement, uh, I guess let us know. We can try to answer. Well, and and as we get to the end of the presentation here, we will switch from recorded mode to go live without recording. And Jeff, if you're willing to stay online, we can then have a conversation about the question. Um, one one closing thought for everybody, uh, or two closing thoughts, because there are some getting started questions earlier. Um, so if you go to semgrep.dev, that's probably the best kind of portal and starting point, um, and you can learn about. You know, how to write rules, how to download the tool, all that. Uh, and then as a personal favor, uh, I'm very curious how I did. Uh, so if if folks would mind uh, filling out this rtc.dev slash survey link, um, that, that helps me uh, prepare for my, my next presentation. So it would be a great gift. And uh, I had mentioned that we're on, on Slack. Um, it's been a really, really powerful community. Um, so as folks have had questions, I feel like the community is getting large enough now we're kind of uh, you know, if you want to do something with Jenkins, you're probably not the first person. Um, you know, if you're trying to do some other 
interesting use case. You, you may not be the first person. So there's other people who are excited about getting this tool up and running uh, and could, uh, could help. Excellent. Thank you, Luke. Thanks very much. So um, the, the request was a Slack invite. So I suspect oh. we may need the Slack channel identified that, there. Or? Yeah, that is a great question. So what I'm actually going to do, uh, let me just go to the home page. And uh, it is, it's just an open Slack. So I'm just gonna scroll down the bottom because I think it's in the footer, yeah. So there's actually just a link to, uh, to join Slack here. It's also linked on the projects readmes um, and you can just click and, and sign up right away. Perfect, thanks, thanks very much. All right, I think our general questions have reached a pause point. Luke, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank everyone for for participating, thanks very much. We will remain online after the recording has stopped for at least a period to allow the those who are in attendance to ask questions. So thanks very much again, Luke. This has been a Jenkins online meetup. The recording will be available through the Jenkins YouTube channel. Uh, it'll think about 24 hours. We'll also post a link to the recording in the meetup.com site.